It's time for Triangulation. We look forward to this every year. Daniel Suarez comes out with a great new book. His fourth appearance today, a brand new book about asteroid mining you're going to love. Delta V is next. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. This is Triangulation, episode 398, recorded Friday, May 17th, 2019. Daniel Suarez. Triangulation is brought to you by Behind the Tech, a podcast with Microsoft's CTO, Kevin Scott. He talks with tech heroes, interesting people, and folks who have made our modern world possible. Subscribe to Behind the Tech, where you listen to your podcasts today. And by ZipRecruiter. Hiring is challenging, but there's one place you can go where hiring is simple and smart. That place is ZipRecruiter, where growing businesses connect to qualified candidates. Try it free at ZipRecruiter.com slash triangulation. It's time for Triangulation, the show where we get together with most interesting people in technology, spend an hour talking about them. And uh, this is, I think, Daniel Suarez's third or fourth appearance. Fourth. fourth. Yeah. Because he keeps writing brilliant page turning books that you just want to talk about welcome back daniel suarez oh thanks for to having triangulation me. we uh, first talked to you after demon and then yeah. freedom tm yeah which was uh a debut that I, I think anybody would be jealous of it was it just knocked everybody on their wow. keisters i appreciate that and then you've covered so that covered ai and uh um, cyber security, security and resilience and gaming you know, a lot of different stuff yep um, and, and then kill you, decision. Covered, you color drones with kill decision, yep, yep. lethal autonomy, all that. Yep, Still lethal in the autonomy. News. There's a phrase, huh? It just you know cocktail influx? conversation. Influx was the last one, right? Yeah, actually, influx and then change agent. Oh, I forgot change so, agent. So influx was that metaphorical tale about asymmetry in knowledge and technological power. Yeah, and change agent was genetic edit. Yeah, I've been busy. So. Uh, and I, I refer people back to the previous four interviews if you want to <laughs> if you want to know more about Daniel Suarez, coder, programmer, Dungeons and Dragons master. Oh, hey, you know what? You're the only one who adds that. That's good. I think it's yeah. important because I ran a campaign story, for ten years. That's where the storytelling right. begins. No, it's a great focus group. Yeah. If, if you want to be a storyteller, you know, try to tell a story with people in the room, and you'll hear if it's a bad story. You know? And I don't think anybody does near future. It's almost sci-fi, but it's so plausible that it's it's like you know like our future s stories. I like to think that they have to reclassify it in the bookstore at some point. You know, yeah. like I, it's sci-fi for a few years, and then it kind of moves into yeah. current events. It's hard science, but it's current events based, yeah. uh, and nobody does it better than Daniel Suarez. His new book is Delta V, which if you're a rocketeer, you'll recognize the term. Try right, those Kerbal space program. Uh, yeah, if you play Kerbal, you know. <laughs> you know how frustrating Delta V can be. The the, uh, the gravity well of the Earth yes. takes a lot of Delta or V or the moon or any heavenly yeah. body. takes a lot of Delta V to escape. Uh, this is, now I don't, I want to say no spoilers in this. Uh, I haven't finished it, so that's another reason. <laughs> I'm about a, I'm I won't do any spoilers of the way through. It is just great. It begins with the most cinematic uh, opening chapter. Again, you're really good at grabbing people and saying, sit down, <laughs> read a book. <laughs> there was a New York Times um, op-ed piece a couple of weeks ago by a novelist who said, stop binging TV, start binging novels. I saw that. And I thought it was, it reminded me of you because what happens, a novelist like you creates an environment, uh, if, you, if you read it as most of us do nowadays, 10 minutes at a time yeah, before we go to right bed. Right before you go to bed. Or listening in the car, at the gym, in little mm -hmm. chunks. You don't become a part of a world. Yeah. And the spell is not cast. Is that true? As you're writing, are you... I mean, I know the people who are reading your books are unfortunately probably piecemealing it, but you're creating a world. Yeah. Well, what I try to do is cast that spell. Uh, yeah. When I'm writing it very often, I'll try to get in the zone. So I tend to... Uh, replicate that in the creation of, of the book. So I will write for 18 hours at a time very often. And really, it's wow. in the meat of that where really... Because you're in the flow you're at You're in the point flow. And you're, you're completely absorbed. Because really, the fascinating thing about books to me, or, or the written word in general is, and this is just going to sound horrible when I say this, it is hacking in a way. 
all we're trying to do is replace reality for the reader. Yeah. I mean, think about it. You're, you're yeah. reading what printed matter on a page and replacing your experience of reality with a fictional one. And that is really a hard task to pull off. And, yeah. and so I try to get into it myself when I'm writing it, to get really into the zone, uh, to be fully immersed in what I'm doing. And, and hopefully that is conveyed when people read it, because of course I then pare it down right. to its essential core element. Oh, so you write a lot more than ends up on the in the book. Yeah, unfortunately I do. I tend, <laughs> I tend to write about two books to get two one to book. One. Yeah, wow. so there's, uh, after I do that, I tend to chisel, well, it's a machete is probably better. I really am ruthless in my editing. That's got to be hard. It is hard. Um, it, it pays, or it pays, it's good to have a, a skilled editor yeah. and an editor who understands what you're trying to do yeah. and understands your, your unique voice. that, so... With code, if you chop out the wrong thing, it breaks. Yes. So it doesn't compile. So. Code, yeah, code tells you. Yes. Uh, the same thing happens, though, with, uh, and, and I, I think we've all experienced this as a, even if you're watching a show like Game of Thrones or you're reading a novel, if there's a discontinuity, something that doesn't quite fit and right. it takes you That's out. That's what of Twitter's it. for. <laughs> yeah. It takes you out of it. It's Twitter will let you know if you're dumped yeah. out of the real world, out of this, out of the fake world into the real world. Like, oh, yeah. that didn't work. Yeah. You don't do that. And when you're in it, and this is what makes, uh, I think your books such page turners, you do get immersed and you, and you're in it and it becomes very genuinely real and there is no false notes. And yeah. that's really got to be hard to do, especially if you're cutting stuff out. Yeah. Yeah. See, that's the key. You have to be honest with yourself. You have to be able to assess what you're doing. It, I, I think actually that's one of the most useful skills that a writer can develop is an ability to gain perspective on their work by putting it down and coming back and honestly hacking into it. And can you see it with a fresh mind? Yeah, I you can. can. I, I can I, How long do you have to put it down? Eh, typically, it's a few months. But oh. this is where an editor is very helpful because yeah. typically what will happen is I'll finish a manuscript and it'll go to my editor. And fortunately, I've had only had two editors, three nice. editors now. And I've been fortunate that my editors have been able to know what I'm doing and they come back with just a few notes that help me more rapidly arrive to conclusions that I generally agree with. So Dut Dutton is your, <clears throat> is your publisher yeah, day one. So they've published six books of mine. Wow. And it's been a they good relationship. They had faith in you. They did. Because you were unknown. When I you... was self-published back when it wasn't cool. It was cool. on a blog, right? Chapter by chapter? No, I didn't do chapter by chapter. Oh. Instead, I, I was much more of a masochist than that. You put the whole thing out at yeah. once? Okay. So going back into the day, this is 2005, 2006, I self-published it again before the Kindle. I think it was just starting the Kindle. It might have been just before because I worked in logistics as a software guy, I figured it was a logistical problem. A book oh was a logistical God. problem. <laughs> and so I made it, I did it with Ingram, I think it was. And they were co-located right across the street from Amazon in Tennessee. So I did all the research for that. And they would only work with companies. Well, that was fine. I had a company. And so I published it through my own press. Wow. And then we just tried to push and it. And Dutton in. found it that way? Yeah, what happened was it started to spread through Google and the tech companies. Yeah. And eventually Wired Magazine did an article on it, I think, in May of 2007. We were selling thousands of copies That's a day. That's such a great story. Yeah, and it really, it did so change my life. It's so much easier now, though. Well, yeah, it is. There is definitely an on-ramp, let's put it this way. There's a, an established progression of how you, how you move your career forward using both social media and yeah. self-publishing, all of those things. Although it might be, there's more competition, so it's yeah, harder I would to stand say out, you, too. There's little of that signal-to-noise yeah. ratio that, when I first did that, I think it was not so much a, tr a well trammeled path. Yeah. It was uh, a little rare for people to do it the way yeah. I did it, and it, it worked. Thank God it worked. Thank God it worked. It, it we like would have lost such great stuff. <laughs> oh, my God. I just and I, So this one is about, again, I don't want to spoil it for anybody, but I think it comes pretty clear by the title and, you know, the, you read the inside flap that this is about asteroid mining. Yeah. See, and you know what? This may seem surprising, again, to the people who know that I write books about very real subjects. Yeah. And typically, I write about technology that's about to become very important or big in people's lives. And space, particularly commercial space, I think is that. Oh, yeah. And this is why I'm planning to do several books on this. And, of course, this is the first time in a while I've done a series of books. I'm so excited to hear you say well, that. You know why? It is because I think this is probably one of the most important issues we're, we're dealing with today. Good. And that's, again, going back 
a few days ago, everybody probably remembers that Jeff Bezos came out and started to talk about space colonies and, and things like that. And a lot of people immediately turned a skeptical eye to that, as they should. And I don't agree with Jeff Bezos about a lot, but I do agree with him about this. That, And I, I think there was a big piece missing in that whole presentation of the why. Right. And, and I know it's like we need more energy, but one of the things that I'm trying to do with these series of books is sort of bridge that chasm between where we are in the present to the sci-fi future everybody always imagines. Yeah. And that actually is no longer just a sci-fi... No, this you could imagine. This, this can every, happen. Yeah. And it, more importantly, it has to happen. And it has to happen for reasons of, of trying to deal with climate change, trying to deal with the vulnerability of us on this single planet. And let's put it this way. We have a limited time to start to deal with this. And, and right now, the UN Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change said we have 12 years to start to deal with, with climate or we're going to face a climate catastrophe. And that's why trying to lift our most carbon-intensive industries off the planet is very important. And it can be done. And I'm trying in this, in this series of books, and Delta V being the first, to show how that could be done. All right, but I want to warn people, despite all the good intentions of this, it's really great to read. <laughs> it's really fun. This is not... No, it's a, not a public service uh, message. It's not, a, you know, a, a manifesto. No, it's not Although at all. Although there's a, there's a, early on, there's a great uh, debate among the space titans. And you have, <laughs> and, they're, and it's, they're all clearly people we know. Uh, are they? Uh, well, at least one or two are. <laughs> Uh, there's an Elon I Musk. No comment. There's a Jeff Bezos. Then there are a few I don't know who they are, but uh, <laughs> including the most important one, Nathan Joyce in here. Yes, I'm not my sure. fictional billionaire. He's fictional. Yeah, but uh, thank God he comes along. But the, the debate among the space titans, and it's moderated by a NASA scientist. Mm -hmm. Uh, one of them, clearly the Elon Musk type, says, "We got to go to Mars. You got to yeah. colonize Mars. Mars is the future. Everybody's got to go to Mars." And another one, the probably the Jeff Bezos type, says, yeah, but first we're going to do space tourism. <laughs> and then finally, your hero, Nathan Joyce, comes along and says, you guys are full of it. <laughs> Neither one is viable yeah. or going to change the world. Yeah. And see, it's funny, when you go and talk to scientists and entrepreneurs... Is that debate going on right now? See, the reason I put it in the book is I don't think it's going on right now. It should now. be going on. It has to be going on. That's why I wanted it to be a public debate. So I threw all of that evidence in... As you mentioned, I tried to make it a really interesting, it's great. Uh, fractious conversation great. where people are going at each other to try to, you know, billionaires have big personalities. Yeah. They very often pull their claws in and they act very reserved. And I wanted to get to the point where they really dust it up. They really talk yes. about why they're doing these things, why they're investing hundreds of millions or billions of dollars in it. And it's part ego. It's part, you know, lasting legacy. I want to leave a legacy. It can also be that they care about the future, but also part of it is competition and, 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 a lot of that happens behind closed doors. I wanted people, I wanted readers to be able to see really what the issues are because we're at this crossroads right now where we're about to go into space. It's interesting, though, that you want to move the debate along a little I bit. I do. You don't feel like it's going in the right direction. Well, like, as I said, I think time is a factor. And again, if, if forget climate change even. I mean, we have uh, the potential for war, the Kessler syndrome. That's, you know, where all the, the satellites blow too. up. A space war could create so much debris yeah. that we can't even get out of our Well, we just saw with India uh, testing. And, of course, America's done this. The USSR has done this. And we're going to see continued tests with ASAT weapons that could trap us here on this planet in just a few years. Now, we're putting, what, Elon's putting up 12,000 potential new satellites into orbit even just an accidental collision could cause us problems so we've really got to be thinking about these things the kessler syndrome is uh it's actually uh neil stevenson uh talks about it in yeah. seven eves yep. is the idea that once you have some debris it then hits it they yeah. hit each other cascade of failure it, it it basically creates a a dome around the united yeah, it's a cloud of debris of debris that you cannot safely get travel through. Yeah. And then, so we're stuck on this planet if that happens for possibly generations while the planet's heating up. So right. here's the frustrating part. We're reaching the 50th anniversary of Apollo. It's <sighs> half a century ago and you and I both remember that. Very well. I remember my father waking me up in the middle of yeah. the night to go see it's that. A big deal. I didn't quite understand what it, why everybody was excited at the time. Yeah. But that's half a century ago, and it is amazing to me yeah. that we're just now saying, hey, let's get back to this. It's the whole universe out there. Yeah. Uh, there's so much in here I want to talk about. Sure. I, I want to ask you why not Mars in just a second. Okay. okay? We're gonna t that's a, kind of provocative, but you make a good case. Uh, we'll talk about that in just a second. <laughs> Daniel Suarez is here. You got if you're not 
just run, just go buy the book. Get it. it's on Amazon. There's, I'm sure, a great Audible version. Oh yeah, yep. It's Jeff Kerner. It's Jeff again. Yep, Jeff. Uh, three or four episodes about go. You brought Jeff in, and he read some from uh, Freedom Tea, and yeah. it was just my. Yeah. It was like so. Good. He's done all of my books. Jeff is great, and I. Uh, I told you before the show, I, uh, when I started the book, the first three chapters or four chapters I read out loud to my wife, which she enjoyed, but uh, Jeff really <laughs> shows how hard this is to do well. Uh, it's, it, uh, so listen to it if you must. But I also want to encourage people to binge it. Hmm. Let's start this trend. Uh, we binge oh, TV shows. Yeah. Give this book three or four hours a night. Give it some time. It only, it'll take you a week to read if you give it a few hours a night. And the thing is, it will put you in that world. And then, of course, you'll be clamoring for the next two books. So you, yeah. we won't keep you too long. You've got to get, get right. <laughs> get to work. Daniel Suarez is here. Delta V is the book. Our show today brought to you by Behind the Tech, a new podcast from Microsoft and their CTO, Kevin Scott. Kevin's great. I've, I've known Kevin for years. I respect the hell out of him. And I'm so glad he's doing a podcast this is the new Microsoft in so many ways. Microsoft is really reaching out to people who are interested in technology. In the, uh, in the uh, Behind the Tech podcast, he interviews tech innovators, pioneers, talks about the history of, the com of computing, all the stuff I'm interested in. Andrew Ng is one of his guests, world-renowned for his insights into AI. Danielle Feinberg, Pixar's computer scientist. How about that? Jaron Lanier. Oh, he's a character. He was, of course one of the main proponents of VR years ago. Now he says tech is the worst. <laughs> These are going to be good. Betting on Bitcoin with Wences Casares, Reed Hoffman. Wow. Behind the tech. Listen to the man who created LinkedIn, Reed Hoffman. Partner at Greylock, author of a new book called Blitz Scaling. That's what they're going to talk about. On Behind the Tech, you'll hear what inspired these guests to author languages, to build the tools, to change the world, to make an impact on the lives of developers and engineers today. This is a great one for people. Oh, there's Christina. She does it with him. Christina Warren, Film Girls on it too. If you're early in your career learning about the history of the tech industry, or if you're from our era, Kevin and my era, you're going to think, oh, I remember, I remember that. This is great. A great listen. Behind the Tech, you can subscribe anywhere. You listen to podcasts, Google Play, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, Libsyn. You know the you know the the routine. Just search for behind the tech. Sign in, tune in, and geek out. I'm always glad to plug another podcast, especially one like that. So Daniel Suarez is here. So one of the things I love about Daniel and his books, you do a lot of research. You're very heavily researched. Obviously, you kind of fall into a hole where you just like, I'm going to know everything there is. You start with cave diving. Did you do any cave diving for this book? No, uh, I don't think I would be let here. You? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, insurance would be very heavy for that. No. She it, laughed out loud. So my protagonist is a cave diver. That's why my, my wife laughed. <laughs> Probably knows that I, I wouldn't be too keen on that. No it's a very diving. dangerous. It's, it's a very, very dangerous. dangerous and yeah. So uh, what I did instead <laughs> was I talked to a lot of cave divers, yeah. and and to me one of the key things about it is they have a culture that's very different from what you would expect. And this is again one of the rewards of doing research uh, with real subjects. In this case, I always thought that that was a you know adrenaline addiction. Yeah. That people were just yeah. the, the thrill, but that's not it at all. And as a matter of fact, numerous cave divers told me that if you are feeling adrenaline, you've done something wrong. You should have <laughs> a dead calm. Yeah, this this focused. Uh, it's sort of a heightened reality, as they describe. You it. describe it beautifully in the book, where your uh, your senses narrow down to right. just the next the present, thing, the present, staying yes. alive, yeah. the present. Right and it's now. very calming the way they describe it. It and, sounds and, like and it. And I don't think. I would be right. calm. <laughs> you do it right. But you have to become so skilled that you can rely upon yeah. your knowledge, that muscle memory that you're going to do it, and you can be in the present. I would constantly be thinking, oh my gosh, the air. And, you know, so no, I didn't do diving myself. Uh, that's perhaps too immersion, too, too much immersion. Uh, the story in here, and I don't want to talk more about the cave diving because I don't want to give anything away, but the story in here is so plausible, so realistic, and yet 
sneaky as hell. <laughs> so it's really, I think you've did a marvelous job. Let's, but I don't, again, I don't want to uh, spoil it for anybody because this is the revelations in the book as you read it are great. There are moments where you go, oh, nice. Well, I will also point out that the science in here, everything from the trajectories, the technologies, a they're all real. They, they all real. either exist as prototypes or in the case of the trajectories, they're all real. Doable. So these could Everything happen. Everything's doable. doable. As a matter of fact, everything here is doable with technology we already have. So this is the frustrating part to me is like, why aren't we doing it? We should be living in a much more interesting world. And this is this book is my effort to try to make that happen. Well, there are space titans. There is Elon there is. Musk. And that's Elon's right. really pushing to go to Mars. He, he says that's that's what we got to do. Yes. I have read others who said no one understands how incredibly difficult living on Mars would be. It is not a sensible long-term escape plan well yeah neil degrasse tyson himself he, he was saying if you are feeling enticed to live on mars go live in antarctica for a few years yeah. and see how you feel about it because yeah. that's about a hundred times more hospitable than mars <laughs> and and that you know and again really uh well, we could terraform it well again that's going to be thousands of years <laughs> and then of course the response to that is why don't we terraform earth <laughs> yeah, to try to we fix it that, we could fix I'd be that. a little cheaper and it's much closer but, uh, yeah, you know, here's the thing. Uh, when it comes to Mars or, e or any planetary body, uh, it was Isaac Asimov um, who talked about planetary chauvinism, this idea that we have this inclination that we should be living on planetary surfaces. a planet, yeah. And we, I don't think we necessarily do. I think uh, we use just a tiny fraction of the Earth's mass to live on, and we're trying to keep it uh, healthy. So if we want to expand industry, expand commerce, and just expand places for people to live, it really does make sense to move out of these gravity wells. And that's really what I focus on. And that's one of the reasons why I'm, I'm kind of skeptical, well, very skeptical about Mars. You, you, in the book, you have one of your yeah. characters say, the entire planet of Mars makes a toxic Superfund site look like a children's daycare. Yes. <laughs> well, that has to do with perchlorates. Is that, that's true, the, yes. what you're saying? Yeah, there. actually, all of that science is absolutely true. A lot of people- They don't know anybody Talks about Nobody this. talks about that. But but again, when I was so doing the research, so perchlorates are what? Perchlorates are a type of salt. It's a uh, it's a chemical that that affects the thyroid. So for it's instance, highly toxic. Highly toxic. If it's in, in the state of California, one part per billion is considered toxic waste, and on the surface of Mars, it's six million parts per billion. <laughs> So you so have a big cleanup. Not healthy. You got to be clean up. You got to yeah. You got a little cleanup there. Now some some folks have have postulated that we could create a bacterium or, or microbe that could start to consume the perchlorates. But again, if we're trying to determine whether there's indigenous life on Mars, that's going to completely throw that out the window if we start spreading microbes yeah. everywhere. So yeah. uh, planetary geologists really want a, a fair chance to try to determine whether life in the universe is common or rare. Uh, so that's just one of the many reasons you don't want to go to colonize Mars. Again, we want to do science on Mars. We're going to visit it. We're going to visit it. We're going to do science, but we don't want a million people living there, especially yeah. not soon. So what do we do? Well, again, I try to look at it this way. Uh, in the age of exploration, the first age of exploration in the 1400s to the 1600s, sailors developed maps of the world that had to do with trade winds and currents. We need to be looking at the solar system from a gravity well map in a way. And that goes to delta V, delta V being a change in velocity. And it is, in that sense, an expression of the energy it requires to reach various things in the solar system and in space. And if you start thinking about the, the map of the solar system as a map of gravity wells, here Earth is at the bottom of a 4,000-mile deep hole, essentially, if you had to climb hand over hand up a cliff face. Uh, Mars is, you know, about a third, and the moon is somewhat less, I think it's about a quarter, but those are deep gravity wells. And anything we do there, if we want to pull that out and bring it somewhere else, it, it's going to require a great deal of energy. So mining the moon and mining Mars yes. are also not a Well, see, again, the idea. moon is somewhat better than Mars, but then again, it, it has not a great mix of materials. It has oxygen, it has titanium, other things like that. But when you look at the mix of resources available in various asteroids, and again, to take an example from the book, the asteroid Ryugu is 450 million tons. And it has nitrogen, it has ammonia, it has hydrogen, it has a lot of things that aren't present easily on the moon. It also has water ice, it has nickel, iron, cobalt. How do we know that it has all that spectra, stuff? Spectra, spectra. And of course, uh, JAXA right now has a probe, the Hayabusa 2 probe there now. You refer and, to that in the book. Yeah, and, yeah. and fortunately for, for this book, I was in, in touch with the Hayabusa 2 team. They were very friendly. Oh, that's so great. And what was, what was trippy about this is I was writing this book 
And I had faith enough in the science and in the spectra analysis that I, I thought, okay, I'm going to write this book and it's going to be about going to that asteroid. I sure hope it is exactly as they... <laughs> so nobody was on, on pins and needles. Well, maybe the, the mission you control were. team, but I was right there with them. It's like, hey, I know you have a probe out there, Please but I have a whole book water. I just wrote. Please I, let there be one. And oh, it, so you literally did this before they actually got I there. I was doing it. At, yeah, exactly. Wow. So when the asteroid Ryugu was coming into focus, I was finishing later chapters of the book, oh, and I so was great. so pleased that it was as they expected. And when I saw all of those boulder fields, and, and people who read the book will, will understand and while that's important later, I mean, it's just a cornucopia of boulders. Beautiful. So, yeah, it's, it's Ryugu's a lovely place there as far are as I'm concerned. Every step of the way, I mean, don't, you're not sugarcoating this. No, every I'm not. step of the way, this is a very challenging thing. Maybe yes. it's easier than landing and living on Mars, but it's not going to be easy. No, and again, we won't be going to these asteroids. Will to we live. live on the asteroids? No. 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 See, that's the key thing. Asteroids, uh, asteroid regolith is, is highly toxic as well. It's an inhalant danger. Basically, it's what very, you want to do is... It's very, fine. It would get right Yeah, near. you want to pull up next to an asteroid, grab and process what you need, and then send it back towards cislunar space. That is the area of the Earth and Moon. You don't put it back on Earth. No, you do not. Because there's a gravity well. Yeah, again, this is a common misconception people have, is that we want to bring platinum and all these precious gems and things like that back to Earth. No. No, the, most of the value is going to be in the trajectory of these, these resources. You want to bring things like iron, water, ice, uh, things that can be turned into fuel. Water can be split into hydrogen and oxygen to make fuel. And so you do this in cislunar space. Yes, you do it in space. And then you consume it in space because we don't have those resources there now. So if you want to build a cislunar economy, and let's say you want to have heavy polluting industry, or you want to build solar satellite power stations that can beam energy clean energy back to earth uh, and again that type of solar would be 500 to 700 percent more productive than earthbound solar you can do that with materials you harvest in space so we could have a really vibrant growing economy without further polluting the earth we could offer a very promising future to young people one filled with adventure uh, that to me sounds very appealing this is not earth orbit though Actually, it is in orbit. See, cislunar space is basically the neighborhood around the Earth and the Moon. So it is orbiting the the Earth. But not near near enough to cause an issue with the yes. Kessler effect? Yeah. See, if you go out 20, 30, 40,000 miles, you're, you're well above that. The Kessler syndrome typically occurs in low Earth orbit. And so if you're getting out to geostationary orbit, you'd really need a hell of a lot of satellites where if they right. collided, collided, they started right. uh, forming a a complete cloud at that distance. You do have a hotel, Leo, and I want to say thank you very much. That <laughs> oh, and that's what, it was named me. after you, yes. <laughs> that's right, the, the low uh, Earth hotel, orbit. low Earth orbit hotel. <laughs> oh, that's the other thing. That's uh, in real life. Uh, we have Bigelow, of course, who wants to create these inflatable hotels. Yeah. You know, or yeah. at least uh, habitats. Yeah. So I hope that his uh, Mater D or concierge <laughs> will have a spacesuit with a painted tie on it, like yours. That you, was a you nice, gotta have class. That was a nice that's touch. Right. I really enjoyed that. You, that's what it's. It's the little things like that that make this a real environment, a real world. That, uh, and because it is only twenty thirty three, it does yeah. feel like we could be living in this. Yeah. I might even make it to this era. You, you know? Yeah, I, I could think be you living will. in this. You look great. <laughs> make it, you'll be fine. Let's see. Uh, Besides, they're gene uh, editing. So there's gene editing by then. I hope. <laughs> Uh, yeah, this is, this is um, so I mentioned Michael Crichton. You really are the uh, spiritual successor to Michael Crichton with the detail, but also the excitement, the page-turning excitement, the suspense. The, there's a lot going on in here. You, I, you feel like you go through boot camp in this book. I love your portrayal of that. I thought that was so well done. Again, I'm trying to do this without telling people what's going on. You know but, what you may be happy about that is Jim Logan, who, who used to be a chief surgeon basically for NASA's flight program and he was present as they tried to build teams of people and yeah. train astronauts and when he read the book and felt that that was a really great portrayal of team building under these I think it's a roadmap for what people should be doing I don't know if they'd go to this effort this extreme but if it, they don't they better yeah well see that's the thing you point out if you're going to send teams in, uh, in space of uh, uh, people, they they somebody better not have a bad habit of singing in the shower. Cause <laughs> yeah, because it's a minor issue on the first twenty days. <laughs> Around day six hundred, it's a homicidal. It gets, it gets uh, to be a little yeah. bit more of a problem. Yeah. Um, oh man, I love this book, Delta V. 
by the way, lowercase v. <laughs> yes. Very. You can't tell from the cover. Uh, I know. That was interesting they did it that way. But I do like the cover, I will say. Uh, oh, yeah. And by, by the way, for those people uh, who mentioned it, this is not actually in space, the cover. The, the image on the cover is on Earth. So it is a caver in a cave on Earth. Because but, a lot of people have said, hey, they're not going to be mining like that on, on an right. asteroid. It looks like you could be on an asteroid looking yes. at it. Well, that's it. It's hinting yeah. at it's the future. It's a little clue. Yes, yeah, a little but clue. But it's actually right from the first chapter. It's right from that yes, very... Indeed. In fact, if you have any doubts, go to the bookstore, pick it up, read the first chapter, ignore the looks from the clerk. If you don't <laughs> then buy the book, then I don't know what's wrong yeah. with you. Yeah. I just, uh, it is so fun and exciting. And it gets better from there, which yeah. is another thing that's kind of amazing. I mean, it has a great... Right, John? John finished it. You read the whole thing, yeah. Cool. Yeah, John, don't tell me. I don't want to know. <laughs> I really tried to bring the science and wrap it in a, uh, a, a thrilling story. Because I, after reading this, I do want people to understand all of the t science and technical issues and still have had a great entertaining it's, time. It's an interesting mission you have because you're not yeah. just sitting down to write a book. Yeah. It sounds like you're really sitting down to, to make a point and to, to educate. And Yes, but like you said, I'm not trying to do a PSA message. No, it's not strong arming them. But it's usually because there's something that fascinates me so much that it won't let me go. When, yeah. I, when I put my head on the pillow at night, I'm thinking about it. And, and that typically tells me what I'm going to write next. That makes it more fun, I imagine. Oh, it is. Oh, yeah. I pinch myself all the time. I can't believe <laughs> I get to do this for a living. It's great. Now, uh, I want to emphasize this is going to be a trilogy will people though get to the end of this and go okay no like these are self-contained stories with, with yeah. demon it was like uh, 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 thank god freedom came out yes, really yes. quickly after that yeah. um no you oh they're self-contained so i yeah. won't feel like oh my god i have to yes. wait and you know this is why i think these stories will stand fine just on their own and that is because there's certain key benchmarks or gates that we're going to reach in this process yeah and each book will be dealing with one of those each oh, step because again when you're building a bridge in real life there's certain steps you have to take before you put that final keystone in and and that's what this is so each of those those i won't say chapters obviously because they're book but each of those installments will feel very satisfying but also want to pull you forward and that's what i'm trying to do here is i'm trying to have to popularize this idea of why it's important, why it could be an amazing future, and it's something we should be doing. In addition to many other challenges we're facing, our movement into space, becoming a celestial civilization, could help us solve a lot of the problems here on Earth. This idea is not to escape Earth. It is not some tech bro idea of billionaires owning space. Right. It's about as many people as possible getting into space, seeing it, and coming back to Earth. Basically, yeah. us having a civilization where we can move back and forth and start thinking in world terms instead of countries and borders and things like that. I hope we're going to see more of Ade because I feel like there's a story there. Maybe, oh, there definitely is. Maybe in book two. I <laughs> yeah. don't know. Uh, oh, good. I just got a little, little confirmation. I hope so. <laughs> I hope so. Our guest is Daniel Suarez. We love having him on. Uh, I think you're. I think you have the uh, prize for being on Triangulation more than any other. Oh, cool. For sure, right? Well, I enjoy it. Yeah, his book is Delta V, lowercase v. If you tweet it, make sure you use a lowercase v. Uh, and it is out from Dutton. Uh, you can buy it on Amazon. You can get it at audible.com. It's yeah. already out, right, Jeff? It's already out. April 23rd, it came out. Nice. Yeah, so it's out uh, everywhere. Definitely. And, uh, and you can also go to Daniel's uh, website and uh, buy it there. In fact, do that because that way Daniel gets a little bit more money, I think. Synopsis. There's a synopsis on there. Don't read the synopsis. Trust me. <laughs> you don't need no stinking either way, synopsis. Either way. <laughs> Just buy the book. You'll need it. And then, I'm serious, binge it. This is bingeable. That's a good, I think, a really good thing to do. Our show today brought to you by... Zip Recruiter. We're actually uh, posted. We have some jobs posted. I think at Zip Recruiter right now. We love Zip Recruiter. It's the easiest way to hire. A lesson learned. We've used other services, and once we used Zip Recruiter, we said this is it from now on. This is it. Zip Recruiter. Hiring is important in any business. The people you hire. Okay, maybe maybe you're not going to put them together in an underground simulator to see if they can all get along. <laughs> Maybe you're not going to do that, but it is important that you hire somebody that 
boosts your company, that helps your company. You, you know, you're not, you're not, you know, you can't hire somebody that's going to bring your company down. That's why it's the company is made of the people you hire. So that's why it's such an important job. And of course, it's also one of the hardest jobs there is because usually you're down a person. Um, you've got to go through a bunch of resumes. You've got to interview a bunch of people. ZipRecruiter solves this problem because with ZipRecruiter, one post gets you to 100 plus job sites. Then ZipRecruiter takes the applicants, reformats their resumes so you, they're uniform, so they're easy for you to read. You can have screening questions, eliminate applicants who just don't fit, and they don't go into your inbox at work. They don't come to your phone. They go into the ZipRecruiter interface, which makes it very easy to, to, to find exactly the right person. In fact, as the applications come in, ZipRecruiter analyzes them and spotlights the top candidates, so you're not going to miss a great match. But here's the thing that really makes ZipRecruiter special. They already have millions of resumes because people post their, you know, when they're looking for work, they go to ZipRecruiter. So what ZipRecruiter does, they use very sophisticated matching technology to look at your job, then look at some of the, you know, the resumes they have, and to find people that match your job. They have the right experience. And then they invite them to apply. That means... You're going to get applicants right away. We did. That was the most amazing thing. When the first time we used a ZipRecruiter, we posted a listing at breakfast. By lunch, we had three really good candidates. And it, our experience is by no means unique. ZipRecruiter is so effective. 80% of employers who post on ZipRecruiter will get a quality candidate on the site within the first day. It really works. Reach out to more people more effectively, process them more effectively, and hire the right person fast. Right now, you could try ZipRecruiter free at our exclusive web address, ZipRecruiter.com slash triangulation. Use that address because that helps us with the show. Um, ZipRecruiter.com slash triangulation. And of course, we thank ZipRecruiter for not only helping us with the show, but also uh, giving us uh, a really good service that we love. ZipRecruiter.com slash triangulation. ZipRecruiter is the smartest way to hire. John wants me to ask you about the cover art. No? About the artwork. Is this oh. later in the book? Yeah, if you look at the back pages. The, if, where you've read, it won't give anything. In. I actually would have loved it if they had a, an indication that there's oh. artwork. Oh! So what happened was I, I hired a, a space architect, oh basically, God. to, to don't, design. Don't look well, at it. I designed it, but he built the models. So the, oh, these yeah. are real models. Yeah, so... Do you have them hanging in your house? <laughs> That's so cool. <laughs> Yeah, so this is an image of the mining ship Constantine from the book, and that grew Should I out. I show it. Is it yeah, gonna, it's yeah, not going to spoil know, anything. It, yeah, that's fine. You can show it because it's mentioned early in the book. I'm imagining it as I'm reading it. Yeah, of course. And it, See, looks, it would have been great if there was some indication in the book that there was images because I get this all no, the time in the, emails. You get to the end and go, oh, uh, there you go. That's what it looks like. Oh, yeah. If you go to my website, you'll see that I have more artwork uh, that did not what's, make it into the book. What's the website? It's probably in color, too, Yeah, right? it's daniel-suarez.com, and you'll see Delta V, and you click on it, and you can see oh. art. Yeah, as a matter of fact, yeah, if you, there you go. Oh. See, now that scan of Ryugu, that's from LiDAR data. Um, that's the real thing. Yeah, a Swedish artist, he, he got that information f to me from JAXA, and I, of course, I listed him down there in the bottom. But... That's the mining ship Constantine, about three kilometers off the surface. Now, the cool thing about this is... This is so cool to when see I was, this. When I was trying to, to do this book, I realized early on... I feel I, like it's real. Like, Well, oh. that's the thing. I wanted to make it real, not only for my readers, I wanted to make it real for me. For you. Because I needed to know what the geography... I, know, put into I always geography, imagined that novelists would do this kind of thing with, well, with, with, with You know that the story. Or, yeah, you, yeah. You have certain things happening and you need those you constraints. You need to see oh, it in your mind's eye. There's the thing they go down. That's oh. right. So The space ladder. Yeah. The design of this ship oh. actually came from a design done by the University of Maryland, uh, a student group in aerospace engineering done around the year 2000. It was called oh, Clark wait, Station. Wait, wait, stop here. Oh, yes. I love those chairs. You mentioned those chairs. I thought, they're not going to put those in a spacecraft. But see, it doesn't feel comfortable now. It's it much feels, nicer. You have to have a sofa. What it's is a so spaceship without a sofa? And by the way, spin gravity. That's the other key thing that I was trying to get at here is we're not going to be spending a great deal of time in space unless we Humans have... Humans cannot live yeah. for long in microgravity. It just doesn't work. Exactly. What is the dose of gravity, the minimum dose we need right. to be healthy? And it turns out that we don't know that yet. Uh, one of the one it doesn't of the necessarily have to be one to one with Earth. It could be doesn't less. necessarily. But the, isn't it amazing that we don't know? And and when people talk about LOPG, that lunar orbital platform gateway, that 
I'm thinking the perfect use for that would be to do some spin Test. gravity tests. Yeah. Because if you're going to be doing the, uh, you know, research out in deep space, let's find the answer yeah. to that question. Because if we find the answer to the question, we can stay out in space longer, maintain our health, all of that stuff. You so it's a key question. One of your characters, when they the, the spins it up, they say, ah, this is what I was evolved yes. for. <laughs> it's true. And <laughs> it's, it's what so we true. were evolved for. Yes. <laughs> so much is predicated upon us having essentially 1G, but maybe less. We don't know what, how much less. It's not hard to do 1G. I mean, what do you, it's three revolutions a yeah, minute. Yeah. Yeah. I, again, what I try to do with these books is really help people understand, sort of viscerally, in this case, 200 meters is about the minimum radius that you can, everyone can That's tolerate those arms for spinning. Extended. So the radial yeah. arms spinning, about a 200 meter radius. And of course, my ship is 106 meters because, of course, my crewmen, uh, crew people are not typical people. They're very... Average. Yeah. <laughs> they're very <laughs> unusual people. But again, they're, they're mountain climbers, they're cave divers. Oh, people like I feel that. like we're spoiling it. Stop the interview now and just come <laughs> back after you've read the book. I don't want to spoil it because it's fun. It, one of the it, uh, great things about my job is I get to read books before they come out. And so it's always, it's good because I don't have to worry about spoilers. I, I don't think this is spoiling anything. No, I don't think so. Believe there's, me, there's plenty in there. There is a it is a long, long way to get from here to there. Yeah, in many, many ways, That's and right. it's really it's really dramatic and and a lot of fun. So you're going to continue with the idea of, I guess, what you're building is a structure of what it would look like if we go into space and what it should look like if we go into space. Yes, yeah. and what are we doing there? Like, and, and what? Yes, what's what are the we urgency? Yeah. And I think there's both urgency and lots of work to be done. Yeah, and you can just uh, tell me when I geek out too much. No, don't geek out. I mean, don't not geek out. <laughs> geek out. So if we go back to 1977, there was a book done by Gerard K. O'Neill, and I can't remember whether Jeff Bezos brought this book up in his presentation, but a lot of this book looks back to that, and it and it was called the High Frontier. Yeah. Now this is 1973. We have the had the Arab oil in crisis. America was rationing gas. Right. We were very worried about availability of energy. And at around that time, he came up with the idea, along with Peter Glazer, that we could, with the technology we had, put these very large orbiting solar platforms in deep space and beam energy back to Earth and provide all of the energy we'd ever need. Now, we could do that with 1970s technology. The technology has only gotten better. And we can absolutely do it. And, Why aren't we and doing it? We but see, that's the thing. This. A lot of people think about that and say, well, that just sounds kind of crazy. I think it's crazy that it is completely possible and it's still in this sci fi category as if it's Star Wars. It's right. not. And again, I'll step through the technology. When we have a, a power plant here on Earth, let's say it's a coal or natural gas plant, half of the energy is just frittered away by thermal energy radiating heat waste heat from that plant before anything is sent down a transmission line. Now, if you had a one kilometer wide solar satellite power station and you were beaming the energy back to Earth by microwaves, you have about 85% efficiency mm. from receiving it in what's called a rectenna on Earth. And all that is, is it looks like chicken wire strung and it can be off the ground. So still 90% of the sunlight could come through. You could have it over crops and wow. it can absorb that energy and also, you don't need so many high tension lines because you can split the beam and have it go to various cities. So, so you distribution's don't, so a you lot distribu easier. Yeah, exactly. And of course, it's not adding any additional heat to the earth because that sunshine was going to hit earth anyway. You're just, you're just converting it and focusing it so that it, the microwave energy hits this rectenna. And it's more efficient. And you know, we could power the entire world. The entire world use, uh, uses about 18 terawatts of energy. Each one of these stations could be 600 megawatts. That's 30,000 of these way out in deep space. Now, that is a tremendously exciting project for all of humanity to engage in because we would solve our energy problems. And I think in the process, we'd have to work with people from all around the world, and it would bring us together in, I, I think, a, a very important task, which yeah. is trying to preserve our home world. Yeah. I hope we don't get to the point where it's such a crisis we can't do it. But see, that's the urgency. And I think you've hit upon it right there. Um, there are a number of things that would prevent us. We have a window of time right now. And I think we have to think bold about space. Yeah. Not just going to the moon to, again, walk around and maybe set up a research station, but think even bigger than that. It's interesting. The ideas are there. Yes, they are. And so is a lot of the technology. So what's missing? Well, I think a willingness, uh, political or otherwise, to spend the money. And I think... Take Mars. Mars colonization, I think 
a lot of the resistance from, let's say, investors to Mars is what's the business case for Mars? Right. Because, okay, you're going to start a, a colony there, but I don't think there's a real business case for it. And if we go back again to the age of exploration, the first age of exploration in the 1400s, a lot of that, you know, Christopher Columbus was looking for gold. He was looking for money. And then later they were looking for slaves. They were looking for spices. There was all of these business, things. Business, business. Exactly. Yeah. Now, fortunately, in space, there are no indigenous people who are going to be right. uh, abused by this. There are resources out there. One of the key things about asteroids, pardon me, is near Earth asteroids have a chance of striking Earth and killing millions and millions of people or exterminating us as a species. So the idea of availing ourselves of their resources seems not at all troubling to me. At the end of the mining, is there nothing left or do you just take what's left and you push it away? Or Well, what's amazing, and I go to some detail in the book, depending on the asteroid, you can use almost the entire thing and what you can't directly use and convert to resources, let's say oxygen, hydrogen, nickel, iron, or whatever, can become radiation shielding. So simply that mass can be used either to help spin a ship or or withstand galactic cosmic radiation so literally everything can be used it's just how useful is it going to be it is a hazardous place out there there's micro asteroids there's radiation there's it is incredibly <laughs> deadly it's trying to kill you every single second yeah. it is a sucking void where if you just relax your vigilance you'll be dead very soon i always laugh actually whenever i see um, references to this suicide pill that they supposedly send Asteroids. You believe me, all of space is a suicide yeah. pill. You just open your helmet, you'll be done. Real, <laughs> real you'll be unconscious very quickly. But, you know, it's that challenge of trying to keep ourselves alive. I mean, we have gotten very good at staying alive here on Earth. Now, now the climate is changing on Earth. We better start understanding how to uh, survive in, a, in a, an extreme environment. And space is a really great place to practice if we build enormous you know, O'Neill cylinder sized places, we can start experimenting with climate and understanding ecosystems and biomes. Because if we can understand the interrelatedness of all the chemicals and all the species and, and the food chain, we can really start addressing issues on Earth. And, and I, we don't want to be tinkering, you know, randomly with Earth. Right. <laughs> we want to be careful. And as you point out in the book, we spend a trillion dollars to wage war. Oh, That's yes. how much the Iraq war yes. cost. Yeah. Is a trillion enough to get started in this? It's more than enough. Because you look at the budget of, of NASA, it was about $21.5 billion before they raised it, I think, one6 And I don't know that they've it's officially raised it. It's not a lot. It's a rounding error. And, and it, take a look at the Defense Department. I think they got a $60 billion bump that they didn't even ask for. And, and then, you know, we can talk about, you know, the bailouts, yeah. $700 yeah. Billion. I mean, if we suddenly started spending half a trillion dollars a year in space again to build infrastructure that would help preserve our entire species and to create an interesting and, and growing economic future for every single person on earth, to make energy available for everyone. And again, not just for billionaires, not having it be owned by just a few people, by society investing in this. I mean, think about how exciting it would be to be a young person thinking, I'm going to learn science and math and these other things to go up and build yeah. these, these orbiting solar satellite power stations. That would change the future. There's, That's amazing. There's one other hurdle, and it's uh, a big one, which is it's, it would have to be, as you point out, a global effort. It would. And as we move more nationalistic, across, not just in the U.S., but everywhere, uh, it makes it very difficult. No one nation could solve this. No. And that's actually one of the good parts about it. Think about uh, maritime law as a great example. Somehow maritime law works. Yeah. Generally, ships can move throughout the seas. You know, we're starting to see the beginnings of problems with that. But this whole quest for nationalism, I think, right now is the fact that there's a sort of retrenchment going on. Yes. We're, we're facing scared. a future where things are shrinking. Yeah. The, the future promises less, not more. Young people will have a life that might not be as nice as what their parents had, and they know it. And that type of uh, shrinking horizon for the future, I think, is making people defend what they have. And that's why I think this idea of expanding into space is so important, because if you look at a horizon where things are growing, there's new vistas, there's new things to be done, new challenges ahead, that is the type of thing where people in, invariably pitch together to get it done. And again, as has been said by many people, the overview effect that idea when you get into space and realize how thin that atmosphere is and how vast the universe is, that's everybody. That's all of us. You don't see those borders up in space. Mm -hmm. And being up there with other people from all sorts of other countries, I think we'll learn to work together uh, again as a species, as a single people. 
We're talking with Daniel Suarez, author of a brand new book. He's, of course, one of our favorite uh, authors. The newest is Delta V. NASA does not play a huge role in this. Ah, but... Well, we'll see. <laughs> see, oh, well, there's a okay, yeah. I don't want to see NASA is interesting to me because, of course, one of the advisors on the book uh, was a senior economist at NASA, and NASA, not just what they do, they also inspire so many people. I think that's right now their primary role, isn't oh, it? Yes, but think how. Aside from putting out probes that go to the edge right, of the solar right, system, right. they've accomplished so many things. I've had a number of debates with people who take umbrage with NASA about their inefficiencies and things like this. But we're talking about a federal agency that has to deal with kind of a crazy funding mechanism where in order to get something built, you have to divide it into like 20 different congressional districts. And so it's not going to be optimally efficient. Right, and, right. and that's not how they would set it up if they had a choice. Right but they also take the blame for it. Right, right. <laughs> so, yeah, there's been some inefficiencies. You know, we look at the SLS system, thing like that. But I think we always need to have a national space program, as most nations do. Uh, space is going to become only more important. So it can't just be the profit incentive. We need to do some, some space exploration, pure exploration, uh, expanding knowledge. We need a mix, basically. And we're going to see a burgeoning private space industry. But NASA will always have a role. I think they're always going to be the ones pushing that that outer frontier. Is Luxembourg a fictional thing in here, or is it real? Because I, I, you do it so well, I can't tell. See, you make me very happy, because <laughs> the fact that you're asking me that question, a lot of people think Luxembourg, and they get it confused with Liechtenstein, and <laughs> right. they think it's postage stamps. Well, it is pretty no, small. No, it's not postage stamps. It's pretty small. <laughs> But they were the leader in communication satellites back in 1985. Uh, I can't remember the exact name. It's SES, but it was a consortium of investors decided to take a gamble on this crazy idea of having privately owned communication satellites. And now they make a couple billion dollars a year in royalties from that. So this tiny nation has the highest uh, per capita income in all of the EU. And it's because of their, their boldness in space, among other things. They, they do a, n a number of other investments. But the point is, in this book, they are doubling down on that investment in space. And we've seen that in real life. I think it was 2017, they had a, uh, I think it was called The Space Law, very originally named, <laughs> where they want to be the friendliest nation on earth to anyone who wants to go out into space and bring resources uh, back for use, not necessarily to earth, but for use in space and building things. And then, of course, arranging the financing and all of that. So stuff. you didn't have to just become an expert in science. You also had to become a legal I am space a, law. I'm a masochist. I don't know <laughs> why I do this. But there is a body of There are knowledge. space lawyers, There's yes. There's space law, and there are space lawyers. Yeah, I'm sure that... I, I can't wait to see the first television show that's like, you know, <laughs> space lawyers. <laughs> you have a space lawyer in here who that's is right. a great character, one of your best. Really, a, oh, really a fun cool. character. I really enjoy him. Yeah, it's the uh, better call soul of space. He's the better yeah. call soul of space. <laughs> That's awesome. So, uh, do you? Is this going to be hard for you to write three books on this subject? No, it's going to be hard to write less. Probably. Here's really? the thing: this topic is so interesting to me, and and again, I will say to people who who write, this book and the creation of it has connected me to so many people I would not know otherwise. Right. That it's opened whole avenues. And again, this is something that I think is going to start to unfold in the next decade. Yeah. So it's very exciting to me. I want to try to explore that near future, make it as realistic and involving as it's possible. It's so exciting. It is exciting. It, it, it's one I want to live in. Do you yes. think in 2033 people will read your book and say, what do you think people will say? I actually, I, I hope I'll be in a control room looking at something. Uh, <laughs> so and I, hope I they'll guarantee say, you, there's I, a 12-year-old right. going to read this book that in 2033... Yes. will be a mission commander saying, thank you, Daniel, because if it weren't for you, we wouldn't be on this mission oh, right now. That wouldn't happens, that be awesome? That would be, my job would be done at that yeah, point. Yeah, no I'd kidding. I'd be very, very happy. No kidding. I, I think that if you look at what inspires uh, geeks and scientists and coders and so, it often is the science fiction they read yeah. as teenagers. Well, it was for me, definitely. Yeah. Yeah, you know, Isaac Asimov's foundation trilogy. Yeah. Not, not that I'm going to become a psycho historian. No, but I feel like in a way you're planting a seed. You must yeah. feel that way. Like this is a little garden you want to tend. Well, you know what it is? I'm just trying to think about to Carl Sagan. That's really the person who planted the seed in me in the sense that in this imagination of, yep. of what we could do in space. And, you know, yes, his novel Contact, but also Cosmos. Yeah. Cosmos, Cosmos really. Cosmos, watching that every Sunday night, yep. PBS. I mean, yeah. 
I think my parents got worried at one point because it's like, why is he suddenly interested in science? What, what happened to him? And <laughs> that was a f switch got flipped. Yeah, and, and what it was is getting this perspective that it is not just important but super fascinating, and how and why. And that's all I'm trying to share. I've done a lot of research in this. And what pulled me into the research was in meeting interesting people. And it's my previous books that typically connect me to these people. Yeah, so in, yeah. in that way, one book leads to it another. It builds on the other. Yeah. Uh, how, what's the reaction from the space scientists and others to this book? Do they, do they read it and go, yeah, that's how it's going to be? Yeah, you know, what's great is uh, so far it's been wonderful. It's nice. been very good. Uh, some really tough characters in terms of uh, uh, don't hand out a lot of praise, not, not very... Uh, you know, forthcoming in that have have been kind to this book, and and again, Jim Logan's a good one. Uh, I just got an email, and I won't say from who, but I, I it was kind. Nice. So we'll see what where that goes, nice. but that leads to the research of the next book. Right. So I think for a lot of scientists, they see science physics in particular being so brutalized in so much fiction, especially sci-fi, uh, crimes against physics uh, there should be a That's website the worst. there should Crimes be a website against physics. like because oh my god <laughs> nothing throws you out isn't it the worst it's like it's you're space, watching something no you're like well you okay scream. that's okay. a concussion right there there's another concussion <laughs> yeah exactly yeah oh, i was in bollywood also has fascinating physics when it comes to dancing and i think i put i just recently put up a gif for the anyway uh, but the point I'm sure being carson has it somewhere. yeah you know the one where they take that catapult they have the warriors launch over the, I, I don't know how you people search. don't understand acceleration very well. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> it'll it'll push your brain. A bit. But again, or deceleration. What gets it? me about that is you can talk to physicists. They will talk to people. Sure, and but they're wary. They are wary because I think for a lot of people who've been technical advisors, let's say on on major films, yeah. Their name goes up on the credits, but that doesn't necessarily mean anybody listened to them. Right. So in, right. in some ways, their name goes up there and, and it might not be technically accurate. So I really love trying to do something where the science is real because those constraints to me heighten the story. The fact that the characters have to deal with real world constraints. Do you ever watch a story where you just felt anything could happen? Yeah. And so there's no tension. I don't like that. No. There's no tension at all. No. It sucks all of the tension out of the story because, of course, they're going to win. They'll just fall on the back of a passing bird and they'll be fine. <laughs> you know, and that that's, I don't like that. Uh, aria ex machina, as yes. they say. I just read a really interesting piece, and I'm going to throw this at you. This is uh, maybe something you'd want to think about rather than having an answer off the cuff, but I'll give you a chance. Uh, by Zainab Tufiki, who's a really brilliant oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, sociologist. She said the problem people are having with this episode, this season of Game of Thrones. Do you watch Game of Thrones? Oh, we're talking about this now. Okay. Am Is, I? Am I? Yeah. Yeah. I've, I've watched about, every single episode. Yes. Okay. Continue. <laughs> and I won't. No spoilers. Um, oh, that's right. Yeah. But she says that the thing that people liked about Game of Thrones for the first liked. six seasons liked <laughs> was that it was sociological, not psychological. And yeah. she says what much a lot of TV is psychological. In other words, the entire thrust of the plot is the psychology of an individual brain, an individual person. Mm -hmm. She said one of the reasons Game of Thrones got away with killing its protagonist in almost every season is it's not about the individuals. It's about the sociology, what the events do to humans and how they react to those events. Yeah. What it makes, causes them to do. What it causes them to do. And that George R.R. R. Martin's thesis is that we're all equally good and bad, but what is brought out by our circumstances is what's really interesting. Yeah. I think that's true of your stuff, too. I don't know if you think about it that way. Um, but, but what you really write about is how the environment we're in influences yeah. the things that we do. Well, I've certainly been told before by people that my, my villains, my antagonists, are not purely villainous. No. Very often you're, you see their point of view, you yes. see why they're doing what they're doing. And that is the most interesting antagonist to me because the fact that they are in conflict with the protagonist, they each have their own perspectives on the world. That is, first of all, much more believable. That's the world we it's live real. in. It's real. It is real. Uh, people are very paper, rarely embodiments paper of evil. thin villains we yes. have, yeah. Yeah, and so i that's why it seems real, because it is more real. Yeah. And I would agree with her assessment of Game of Thrones. I think there's a perfect assessment of it, actually. And and also, and I don't know if this is too much of a spoiler, where it's gone wrong probably recently. Yeah, yeah, because it's become more about the, the psychology yeah. than anything and plot else. armor. And plot armor, <laughs> yeah. So that's interesting. So as a novelist, and, and you now did you think you were going to be a novelist when you were a kid? 
Ah, uh, wow. At various times, and then I would mention it to my parents, and they would dissuade me yes. from from that. So yes, uh, <laughs> there's no there's no money in that, Daniel. But you know, it's funny because I did in college. I got an English literature degree. So you did want to write. Yeah, and I always wanted to write, so I guess I held my cards close, close to my chest. And I got involved in tech and software very early on. But I've always found that an ability to communicate, at least clearly, well, is useful in any Every field. In every single field. However, and we are lucky to have somebody who, as Steve Jobs used to say, the intersection of arts and science, of arts yeah. and technology. Yeah. Somebody who has a deep f uh, understanding of science and technology like you do, but also can communicate it. Yes. That's when you get something very special. Well, that was actually one of my talents when I was in tech, was the ability to communicate yeah. to the corner office people right. what is going on with the tech people yeah. and why yeah. it's not chaos, yeah. <laughs> that this is part of the price, you know, to help them understand. So then do you think when you watch something like Game of Thrones, do you think as a novelist, as a writer, and you think about it, or do you get to relax into it and enjoy it? Oh, he's boy. sitting there going, <laughs> don't ask her. <laughs> bad idea. Plotting was terrible. <laughs> oh, you know, <laughs> I bet she typically leaves the room when really? I'm watching TV. Oh, that's funny. You know what it is? It depends. When somebody is casting the spell, it, it, let's be very clear. I've, I've watched every episode of Game of Thrones because I'm a big fan. And I'm still it. sucked into it. Of course. And, and I'll watch, I'll watch the final one. Yeah. Uh, I may be on medication. But <laughs> Afterwards, for sure. But here's the thing. <laughs> I, I also, now that I've been a writer for a while, and not, not in television, and, and again, that's more art by committee. You have so many other hands, and you have you know, the yeah, studios, you have himself. everybody else. The yeah. great thing about being a novelist is it's pretty much a singular vision. You yeah. can go and do what you're going to do. Uh, but taking that into account, I, I do tend to watch things or experience things or reading them when I'm reading a book. If it's in my genre especially, I tend to start looking for scaffolding and things like that. Because yeah. you understand, I understand how it works. How the scenes... There's a, there's a craft. Yeah. And when I am early on determining that a book, the writer of the book knows the craft well, I find myself unclenching and I can just relax and let the work be done. Very Do you ever good. see that? Yes. And then I have the same thing. The if, clumsiness, if, though. If I see clumsiness, yeah. I immediately... You it's tighten like, up. Ugh. It's sort of like a romance. It's being seduced. Yeah. And, and really, again, it goes back to what I was saying about a book or story tries to encompass and replace your entire reality while you're reading right. it. And that is a seduction in a way. And a clumsy seduction is an upsetting thing. And when and, you're in the yeah. hands of a master, as you are with Daniel Suarez, oh, well, that's, that's then nice. you can relax <laughs> and just enjoy. And you will enjoy Delta V. This is such a good novel. I, I hope it becomes a great success and maybe even more hope that the message is heard because uh, it really is an important message. Yeah. I think what you're saying is vital. And also an exciting one. Yeah. And again, I, I like... Yeah, the, very uh, exciting. I'd like to be in that yes, world. Yes, and as would I. And, and so this is aspirational in the sense that I want other people to feel this excitement. Uh, again, it's an uncertain undertaking, but it's one we must do. It's an adventure. Yeah. And if you think about young people... I think young people want big things to do that where success is not necessarily assured, but if they achieve these things, they've accomplished something great. I mean, who doesn't want that for their life, yeah. right? So yes, that's what I'm trying to do in my own small way with this book. Uh, Godspeed. It's awesome. Uh, and my, I think one of my favorite moments is uh, the text message. We're heading to the store. Can we pick anything up? <laughs> is just when you get there, you'll know. <laughs> Delta V. Huh? <laughs> well, I didn't say what the yeah. response was, but I'll, I'll bring water as the answer, yes. Uh, Daniel Suarez, Delta V, such a good book. Please read it uh, and read the next one and the next one after that. And if you're a young person and you get inspired by it, go go do it. We need you. We Amen. need you to do Amen. it. Thank you, Daniel. Oh, it's my pleasure. Oh, it's always a pleasure. We do triangulation. Kind of our new time is Fridays, 11.30 a.m. Pacific. That'd be 2.30 Eastern, 17.30 UTC. If you want to watch live, twit.tv slash live. There's a live audio and video stream. And there's a chat room, always. Uh, but when there's a live show on, that's usually what they're talking about at irc.twit.tv. You can get everything on demand. If you're listening on an airplane, I know a lot of people do to triangulation, go to twit.tv slash TRI. That's where all of the shows are. There's several hundred of them now. Some of the most interesting conversations you will ever hear. I'm not the only host, Megan... Maroney, Jason Howell, De Denise, ha uh, Jason Howell, and Denise Howell, no relation. Uh, both, uh, all three of them uh, do shows as well. And I think we really just get a great body of stuff in here. So please uh, stop by 
on a Friday morning or download your uh, your favorite episodes of people you're interested in and listen to Triangulation. Thanks, everybody. We'll see you next time. Bye-bye.